Greetings to you and welcome to session 24 of John's Gospel. I'm Timothy Muse, lead pastor here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, and it's a joy to be with you today as we spend this time together wandering, waiting, embracing the Word. It's a joy for you to be with us today. Thank you for tuning in. Whether you're listening to this as it's posted or you're listening to it later, I thank you for your willingness to be part of this journey. If you're joining us for the first time, then welcome. I'm encouraged and excited to hear that. I would definitely encourage you to go back and listen to some of the previous sessions. We have been walking through the Gospel of John since the beginning. So we started, obviously, with chapter 1, verse 1, and we've walked through it. So I would certainly encourage you to go back and check it out. You can find them on my YouTube channel, where you found this, where you where you are listening to this, uh, and, and kind of get caught up. But certainly, you can stay here, enjoy, and participate. You don't have to disconnect now and go back and check in. You can follow along now and then as you're at your leisure go back and check things out if you're returning for the next session then welcome back thanks for coming out thanks for being part of the work that we're doing here part of the mission part of the job is to proclaim christ and i've said this before and i know it sounds kind of like a broken record i don't intend it to sound like a broken record but it needs to sound something permanent. It needs to be really embedded in us. We as humans, we take a multitude of times to hear something before we really let it sink in and dwell in our being. So our job as Christians, our job as a community of faith is to proclaim the gospel and to get the word out there, to share with others the good news of Jesus Christ. That's our job. That's why God put us in the world. That's why God calls us in community. You know, we, we might want to think that the church's job is to propagate salvation. And part of it is, you know, we have this beautiful gift in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and this way of salvation that God has opened up to us through this, through the gift of the Son. And we celebrate that, and we give thanks to God for that, and that is powerful and awesome and incredible. But part of that is our job to go out and tell others of this. You know, we're here not because God came down and and sat down on our bed and told us what we had to do. We're here because someone loved us enough to pay attention. Someone loved us enough to introduce us. And if you're listening to this and you're moved by the Holy Spirit and, and something moved inside of you to search it out and this is where you found yourself, then thanks be to God. Then thanks be to God for that. And I celebrate that and 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 I, I I'm so I'm so happy for that. I, I truly truly, truly am happy for that. Thanks be to God that that's where you are and that's what you've brought. I personally, I was brought to Christ because someone loved me enough to introduce me to him. Someone brought me to the baptismal font and showed me the way. And I'm forever thankful for that. That's our job. That's who we are as Christians. That's the responsibility of every believer and as of the faith community is to share this incredible and magnificent story with others. So I would encourage you, I would delight you to share this stories with others. I would I would I would encourage you to take any and every opportunity possible to share this story with others. And for this it's so easy. I mean it really is. You're you're on here um, presumably you got connected here through uh, some kind of social media, through our webs or through our Facebook page or through our uh, Instagram account Maybe you connected through the website. Uh, again, that's awesome. Uh, however you got here, but most likely you got here in a way that would be so easy to just share it. Go on to our social media accounts. Go on to Facebook or Instagram and share it. Click the share button. Give us a comment, something. Because what happens is then you participate in the exponential sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you never know. You could put something out there. You could share this video and not know anything about anything and not pay attention to it. But someone else could could catch that share and could be hearing about this at 2 o'clock in the morning when they have no hope left, when they think that life is done. We don't know where people are at. We might want to assume that we do, but we don't know where people are at. The best thing that we could possibly do is believe that the story of Jesus Christ is enough for others and to share it to push that share button, push that like button, share this out there. Tag me in it. I'd love to see where you're at. Send me a comment, whatever. Look, folks, 
I do this because I want you to be educated. I do this because I want you as brothers and sisters in Christ to know the Bible. I want you to know your God, and I want you to know the gift of salvation, and I want you to know the power of the scriptures. Absolutely. But I also want to give you tools to be able to share with others so that if you can't tell them about Jesus Christ, because you either you're concerned or you're worried or you're anxious, or you don't think your words matter, then you have a vehicle to tell them about Jesus Christ. You have a vehicle, something that's close to you. So you can share this with someone and say, hey, you know what? This guy who's doing this, he's my preacher. He's my pastor. Come see what we're all about. Come experience what we're all about. That's why we do this. And that's the call that we are given as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the call that we are given as community. This is never meant to be a passive thing. We are never meant to just show up and sit down and take something and then leave. This is not transactional spirituality where I get something and you get something and God gets something. No, what we get from God, we could never, never acquire for ourselves. Never. In everything we do, we could give our entire life to pursuing wealth and knowledge, but we would never have enough to be able to convince God to let us in. What we have in God is a gift. And because what we have in God is a gift, it is our duty, our call, our responsibility to get out there and share that gift in ways that others will experience it. And this is part of it. So I'm glad you're listening. I'm glad you're tuning in. Thank you very much. Share it out there. Get it out there. And if you don't know how, contact me. We'll figure it out. I'll figure out how to help you do it. And if you want more, more can be arranged. We can certainly do that. I have two years of Bible studies already wrapped up on the YouTube channel. Revelation, uh, the, the book of Romans. I've got a study on the Nicene Creed, what it means to be Lutheran. Okay, Pastor Diana, my pastoral partner here at St. Paul's, she's got a couple. She's got Gospel of Luke out there. She's working through the book of Acts. There's information out there. And if you need more, want more, we can work it out. Every week, the sermons and the prayers and the worship service is put up. Use what is out there to proclaim the kingdom. And the nice thing about social media, the nice thing about the computer, you don't have to engage anybody. You can just push a button and away it goes. So use it. Use what you can. All right, so uh, always, as we carry, as we study the Bible, I encourage you to have a Bible open before you. Uh, one of the best ways to study the Bible is to open the Bible. Action equals action. You know, it, it's, it's a truism. If you want to move, if you want action, you got to be action you got to move. You are never going to gain action if you're sitting still. Action equals action. You want action and study in the Bible? Open the Bible. Open the Bible. Get it open before you. Either a printed copy uh, or digital copy. It doesn't matter. The words are the words. But it's important to open the Bible, get it open before you, and read what is written. Read the words before you. So powerful. Because there's so many assumptions we have in the Bible. So many things we assume are in the Bible that just aren't in the Bible. And we want to make sure that we break down those assumptions. If we're going to share this stuff, if we're going to talk about this stuff, we want to make sure that we are, that we're knowledgeable about it and not just taking colloquialisms and what we think we've heard. So get in there. You've heard me say many times, I believe we should read the Bible every day. I believe we should be in the word every day. Even if you're reading a verse, even if you go to the Psalms and you start with Psalm number one and you read a verse from Psalm number one a day. And you get through until you go to Psalm number two. Even if you are just opening yourself to one verse a day, that is still more than what you were doing before. And you are in the word every day. And trust me, you know, reading a verse in the Bible is like eating a potato chip. You can't just have one. You get more and more and it grows and grows. And the wisdom and the desire and the knowledge just keeps expanding, expanding. So I would encourage you, have your Bible open. Know your Bible. Study your Bible. Work with your Bible. John is the fourth gospel in the New Testament. So the Bible study divided in the Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament's the story of God's work from creation up until the birth of Christ. New Testament, birth of Christ, all the way up through the culmination, the apocalypse, the new church, new heaven, new earth. However you want to look at it. So those are the those are the divisions. Four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what's called the synoptics. The synoptic Gospels are, they're, they're similar. That's why they're, kind of, they're, 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 they're syncopated. They're in rhythm with each other. That's what it means to be synoptic. They're in rhythm with each other. The stories, the ideas, they're all in rhythm with each other. They're not the same. They're not one story. They're one story told in three different ways, and they all have their different ideas, but they're, but, but they're, in, they're, they're in rhythm 
with each other, if you will. John is different. John is far more spiritual. John is far more metaphysical, far more um, it, nowhere near as chronological and narrative and grounded. And that's really one of the reasons why we like John, because John gives us some of this mysticism, some of this otherness. And we're going to see that. We're going to talk about that today. Well, we're going to delve into, you know, kind of the separated self and the disconnect between human and God and the disconnect between human and self and human and each other. These are some of the things that John really drives into that the synopsis do talk about from a story perspective, but they leave the story up to the hearer, the interpreter to understand it. All right, so we're in chapter 8, uh, John chapter 8, and we've been studying chapter 8 for a couple weeks now. I don't think we're going to get through all of chapter 8 today. Again, this is a very meaty chapter. And as I've said multiple times, we have no end time. That's kind of the joy of this. We just keep going and going and going. We have no end time. So we get there until we get there, all right? And however long it takes, as long as we make sure that we cover everything, that's what's most important. So if you're looking to wrap up the Gospel of John in a couple weeks, this isn't the study for you. Uh, I try to be really in-depth, really go in deep, so you get a grasp and and an understanding of what's taking place. All right, so we're in chapter 8. We're in verse 30. We're going to start at verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have not been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will be made free? All right, so Jesus has been talking about, he's been, he's been dialoguing with the Jews. Now remember, um, in a lot of times when, Jesus, when John talks about the Jews, he's talking about the Pharisees and the scribes. In this particular instance, he, you notice he speaks a bit differently. He doesn't just say the Jews, he says the Jews who believe in him. So the Jews who believe in him could represent people like Joseph of Arimathea, who shows up at the end of the gospel to take Jesus' body off the cross. Nicodemus, who, remember, came to Jesus at night in chapter 3, but then showed up in chapter 7 and, and seemed like he might have actually been advocating to follow Jesus. So there are those who are starting to believe in him. And actually, you know, we see it in the last chapter, and and actually in the last portion of this chapter, what we covered last week, uh, verse 21, verse 29, and the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone for I always do what is pleasing to him. Verse 30, this is right before where we were. And he was, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. So there's a growing uh, community of believers. Now, remember back in the beginning of chapter six, Jesus had a pretty big following, but a lot of them fell away because they couldn't follow the teaching. This whole understanding of Christ being son of God, taking him in, eating and drinking, all these things were very, uh, they, they were very disconcerting to some of the believers. So they didn't believe in him. They left him. Remember, Jesus says to the 12, you know, are you going to leave me too? And that's where we get that powerful statement, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Okay, so... So now Jesus is talking to those who believe in him, and he's saying, if you continue in my word, if you keep doing what you've been doing, so you're getting my word, you're following my word, you're grasping it, if you continue in it, if you continue to follow it, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And the the, the truth is God's love in the world. God's connection to people in the world, that it's not through the law, it's not through the, 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 the religious encounter, it's not through the ritual, it is through a relationship with God, and that's the freedom. Because, you know, keep in mind, in the Old Testament, in, in Jewish time, you know, if you wanted to encounter God or interact with God, you had to come to Jerusalem, you had to go to the temple, that, that God was not accessible anywhere, everywhere. Uh, that God was only in one place. But the truth is that it's a relationship, not a practice. The truth is that God is everywhere. The truth is that God does care. The truth is that God is connected. And that truth leads to a massive amount of freedom. That's the freedom. The freedom that Jesus is talking about is being freed from this fear of God not being around or fear of God not paying attention or fear of God not knowing or fear of God not being accessible. Okay, That's what Jesus brings. The truth, the truth that Jesus brings is God is right there and that God is present all the time. Remember what he said to the woman at the well. There will be a time when you will worship God in spirit and truth. 
Okay, spirit is anywhere, everywhere that the, 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 the Holy Spirit, the living God surrounding us. And the truth is God is right there and cares. That's the spirit and truth. And Jesus is starting to lean into this when he starts to talk about the truth. And the truth is that those who believe in and follow the words of Jesus are leaning into that freedom that they get in God. Well, of course, those who are listening to him, they hear freedom Um, And they think about slavery. So they answered him, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Okay, two couple of things here I want to make sure of. So for a Jew, like anybody, I mean, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to say that that this is just a Jewish thing. Um, This is a human thing. You know, they're claiming their connection through Abraham. They're saying, look, we were, we're, we're, you know, we're descendants of Abraham. All right. So, so there's something to that. There's something, there's a prideful thing to that. There's a, and, and in a lot of ways, it is very important to be descendants of Abraham. It's important for the people to be descendants of Abraham because as descendants of Abraham, then they have this, this, this bloodline connection. We've talked before about the importance of the bloodline and the importance of the purity of the bloodline in ancient Israel. So, so those who believe in him, including the Pharisees, are like, hey, you know what? We're already connected here, dude. We're already part of this because we're descendants of Abraham. So, so, so it really doesn't matter kind of what we do or what we know. Our connection is enough. Now, I, I know we might want to like kind of, kind of like, like revert back a little bit, say, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty dumb. That's pretty, um, but you know, that's pretty arrogant, but in a lot of Christian churches, we see, well, I've been a member here all my life. So, well, membership doesn't mean anything. If you're not following the gospel, membership doesn't mean anything. If you're not proclaiming Christ crucified, just like being a child of Abraham doesn't mean anything. If you're not following the law, you have to follow the law. You have to be part of the law. You can be a child of Abraham all you want. But if you're not following the law, if you're not doing what God asks you to do, your lineage means nothing. As a matter of fact, it's a joke. Because you're thinking that your lineage is going to keep you in contact with, with God. When really, quite frankly, you don't even care about your lineage. Your lineage you're using is nothing more than a bargaining chip. So so there are they're, they're saying to him, look, I mean, we're children of Abraham. Um, and that means something, um, and which to which Jesus is like, yeah, that means something, but y- you've got to use it. Okay. That's like owning a Ferrari. Well, you can own a Ferrari, but if that thing's sitting in a garage all in the dark and nobody ever sees it, then nobody ever knows you own a Ferrari. If you're not driving it, then what's the point of having it? Well, if you're not enacting your Abrahamic bloodline, if you're not enacting being a child of Abraham, then what's the point of proclaiming it? And that's what Jesus is arguing. Jesus isn't arguing their place as, as children of Abraham. He's arguing of their use, their importance, their vision of that. And the other thing that they say, you know, is what do you mean by saying, you know, we, we've never been slaves to anyone? What do you mean by saying that you will be made free? Okay, so anybody who follows truly understands being a child of Abraham understands slavery. Okay, they were slaves. They were slaves for 430 years in Egypt. Okay, no, anybody who really knows their history is not going to forget the exile. All right, or not going to not forget the the Exodus. Okay, and the exile into Egypt. All right, so 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 there's so so in some ways, um, you know, they're showing their their shallow understanding of what it means to be a child of Abraham. And in other ways, now, and it's true that they've never been slaves to anyone in their own generation. And this is kind of the caveat. And it's probably where a lot of them are talking about. It's not that they've forgotten, but it's like, look, we as children of Abraham, we, this generation have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying that you'll be made free? So, so, they're talking as though Jesus is referring to them as being immediately enslaved, that you're enslaved right now. And they're saying, we've, we've never been slaves. I, I've never been slaves. Okay. We, as in this generation, not we as a people going all the way back to Abraham, but we as a generation have never been enslaved. And that's probably the more likely um, context to what the, what the Jews are saying to Jesus. We in this generation have never been enslaved. We have always been free. So what do you mean by saying you will be made free? Well, Jesus goes on. Very truly, I tell you, 
Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. I know that you are descendants of Abraham, yet you look for an opportunity to kill me, because there is no place for me in your word. I declare what I have seen in the Father's presence. As for you, you should do what you have heard from the Father. Okay, so Jesus, again, and this is great. This is great because Jesus doesn't argue their place as children of Abraham. He doesn't. He says, I know that you're descendants of Abraham. I know that you come from the bloodline of Abraham. But the problem is this, your bloodline, your descendants of Abraham, it really means nothing because you're not living it out. You're not living as descendants of Abraham. You're looking to kill me. You're looking to kill a prophet. You're looking to kill a teacher. So, so even though you're claiming to be children of Abraham, and I know you are, you are looking to kill me because there's no place in you for my word. So again, and, and, and really what this boils down to, what this boils down to, and, I, and I'll get back to what was, what was said earlier in just a minute. What this boils down to is their unwillingness to see Jesus as part of the continuation of Abraham's work. Now in Matthew and Luke, they both have genealogies and our genealogy traces, uh, traces, you know, where someone comes from and, and, and Jesus is traced back through David, back to Abraham, back to Noah, back to, uh, back to Adam and Eve. So Jesus traces his lineage through Abraham. He is also a child of Abraham. He has Abrahamic blood running through him. He has Davidic blood running through him. He is a a direct descendant of the house of David, which is what the messianic call is supposed to be. So he has the blood of David running through him. He has the, the connection um, and he's like, look, and I know you're, and, and he's like, and he's not arguing their place, but he's saying, look, you're not living into this because there's no place in you for my word. There's no place in you for the realization that I'm the continuation of the work of Abraham. I'm not here to stand against Abraham. And there's nothing that Jesus does. There's nothing that Jesus brings that stands against Abraham. Jesus is not in opposition to Abraham. Jesus is the next level. I don't, I don't want to say Jesus is Abraham 2.0 because he's not, but Jesus is, is carrying on the mission of Abraham and expanding it exponentially by caring for the poor and the needy, by raising up the work of God, by making a generation, um, by, by making a generation as numerous as the stars in the sky and the grains of sand, by opening up salvation to everyone. So Jesus is not in competition with Abraham. Jesus is in connection with Abraham. It is those who claim Abraham that can't see this. I declare to you what I have seen in the Father's presence. As for you, you should do what you have heard from the Father. Now keep in mind, Abraham did reside in the presence of God. Abraham was in the presence of God on numerous occasions. The Oak of Mamre was one of them. Um, the proclamation that, that uh, you know, in, in Ur of the Chaldeans, um, when, when Abraham and Isaac go off for the sacrifice. Okay, so Abraham was in the presence of God and heard God speaking and directing. And so is Jesus. So Jesus is not doing anything more than what Abraham had already experienced. So Jesus is actually closer to Abraham than, than the Jews who believe in him were. Um, so Jesus is like, look, I know you're descendants of Abraham. I know you got Abraham's blood in you, but you're not acting like him. You're looking for an opportunity to kill me. You're looking for an opportunity to kill me because I'm bringing what God does. Now, Abraham, I mean, when Abraham was speaking with God, nobody was trying to kill him. Pharaoh was a little upset with him because he lied about, you know, who Sarah was. But, but, you know, nobody was trying to kill Abraham. But the descendants of Abraham are trying to kill Jesus, not because he's blaspheming, but because he is bringing into question their power and their place. They have used their place as a descendant of Abraham, not for the good of the temple and the good of the people, but for the good of themselves. Which takes me back to the first part of the second 
piece that I read here. Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you are free indeed. Okay, so so Jesus, so, so this, it would be this. We're all slaves to sin because we all commit sin. None of us, none of us is sinless. None of us is sin free. And I don't care how much you strive to be sin free, you're still going to be sinful. You know, as a matter of fact, Martin Luther, when he talked about sin, um, Luther never advocated for striving to live a sinless life. He never advocated to strive to live a sinless life. And the reason he never advocated to strive to live a sinless life is you can't do it. You can't do it, no matter how hard you try. And so actually what happens is you're spending all of this time, all of this energy, all these resources trying to do something that you will never do rather than doing what you can do. So Luther, and, 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 and this is true, Luther said sin boldly. So in other words, rather than trying to minimize your sin, convince everybody else you're not a sinner, you're a sinner. Welcome to it. I'm a sinner. Welcome to it. There are days where my sin clings a little bit more closely. There are days where it doesn't cling as much, but I'm a sinner to the core, broken and in need of redemption. Um, So if I try to be less of a sinner, if I try to spend my energy sinning less, rather than just acknowledging my brokenness, acknowledging my sin, and then praying for forgiveness and praying for redemption and release, that's the whole point. Spend your energy praying for redemption and release. Get it and then go out and do something good for the sake of the kingdom rather than spending all of your time trying not to sin because we're all slaves to sin. That's what Jesus says. You know, very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Everyone sins. Therefore, everyone's a slave. Okay, you, you, see, the, you, you see the deductive reasoning. Jesus lays out the statement. So, um, the, uh, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Statement number one, everyone sins. Statement number two, so take out what um, you take out and, and what your answer is, everyone's a slave. Okay? Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Everyone sins. So therefore, everyone's a slave. That's the deductive reasoning. And you can't get out of that, that slavery. A slave cannot free themselves. The only way that they can be freed is when the son makes you free. You will be free indeed. When the slave owner releases the slave is when the slave is free. And in the ancient world, so you you had a father-son household. So the father ran the household and the son, you know, had power. If the son freed a slave, then the father would, for the most part, acknowledge that and accept it. So if the sun makes you free, you're free indeed. If the air makes you free, you're free indeed. And if if the father passes away and the air gets the house and then the air releases a slave, then you're free. But that is a gift. You don't get to force it. You don't get to make it happen. And that's the point. That's what Jesus is trying to drive home. Everybody sins. Everybody is a slave. The only way to be out of that slavery is by the son releasing you. So what Jesus is driving home to the descendants of Abraham, not that they're slaves in the traditional senses that another another nation or another people owns them, but sin owns them. And the only way that they're going to be freed from that sin, that ownership, is by the son who sets them free. And that goes back to that word. I declare what I've seen in the Father's presence. You should have heard from the Father. You want to kill me because there's no place for you in my word. So you're a slave. And the Son has come along. This is the heir to the Father who's come along to free you, but you don't want to be freed. You don't have any room in your life for me as your emancipator. So therefore, you're not going to be freed. That's what Jesus is saying. That's the point. You're not going to be freed because the emancipator, I'm the, I'm the emancipator and you're not listening to me. You're not paying attention to my word. You're hearing your own word. You're hearing your own stuff, but you're not hearing from me. Okay. So they answer him. This is verse 39. They answer him. Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing what Abraham did. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I have heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are indeed doing what your father does. 
They said to him, we are not illegitimate children. We have one father, God himself. Jesus said to them, if God himself were your father, you would love me for I came from God and now I am here. I did not come on my own, but has, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot accept my word. You are from your father, the devil, and he chose to, and, and you choose to do your father's desires. He is a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is from God hears the word of God. The reason you do not hear them is that you are not from God. All right, so Jesus is going on. All right, so 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 Jesus talks about being a slave, trying to kill me, you know, and and they say, look, Abraham is our father, our 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 genetic father, our lineage father, our spiritual father. Abraham is the is the creator, is the is the one who started the Israelite nation. God started it, but it, God chose Abraham and, and Sarah. Okay, so yeah, I, I know God was the one who initiated it, but Abraham and Sarah were the first of the tribe of Abraham, if you will, the lineage of Abraham, if you will. So they claim Abraham as their spiritual father, as the one who started off. So they stand in line with Abraham. They follow along in the spiritual direction and in the physical direction. They, they probably can trace their bloodline, their lineage back to Abraham. And, but Jesus said, look, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing what he did. But now you're trying to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You indeed are doing what your father does. So look, Jesus responds, if you were Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. And Abraham listened to God. Abraham trusted, even when it didn't seem to make sense. Abraham was faithful in his fidelity and his, and his, and his belief in God. He continued to follow God, even when it didn't make sense. All the way up to believing at over 100 years old, while his lovely wife was 90, that they would have a child to which they did. Abraham listened. Abraham believed. Abraham showed faithfulness even in the face of that which didn't make sense. They don't. And that's the challenge that Jesus is making. And here's the thing. Here's the problem is that they think, or at least they're functioning under the idea that Jesus doesn't know anything about Abraham, but he does. He knows because he watched it happen. He watched it all play out before him from Ur of the Chaldeans down to Egypt, back to the promised land with um, Ishmael and Hagar and all of that. He was part of all that. Jesus watched it all play out. But if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing what Abraham did. That's what he says. If you were truly, again, and there's no question. Remember, he said, you know, I know that you are descendants of Abraham. Notice the different wordology here. It's very important. You're descendants of Abraham. You follow in the lineage of Abraham, but you're not children of Abraham because children do what the father says. Children carry on the lineage and you're not carrying on the lineage. You're not doing what Abraham did. You're looking to kill me. You're looking to participate in murder and lies. And there is another who is the father of murders and lies. And we call him the devil. So even though your descendancy is from Abraham, you are functioning from the devil's standpoint. Now, one could certainly understand that as Pharisees and scribes and leaders of the synagogue, this would not go over well to be called a worker of the devil or a child of the devil. And even if the devil wasn't this um, Hollywood creation, for Jesus, the devil is still a liar and a thief and a murderer. And so what he's doing is he's saying to these people, yeah, you have a father, but it is not Abraham and it is not God. It is the devil. It is the devil. You are indeed doing your, what your father does. Of course, they respond, we are not illegitimate children. We have one father, God himself. So, so now they're really kind of amping it up. Now, remember, it's very rare to call God father. Jesus refers to God as father, but the people didn't. The people didn't see God in that fatherly, intimate connection. They saw God in a very wrathful sort of way, a very uh, judgmental sort of way. But the people here are mimicking 
uh, Jesus' words. Now, one of the things to keep in mind, one of the things to keep in mind, we want to read this as adversarial or contentious. I don't think there's meant to be any contention in this. I don't think Jesus is looking to really kind of um, hurt anybody or drive anybody away. But Jesus is really trying to move them away from their connection, their dependence on their lineage. Their role as children of Abraham is not going to get them anywhere. It's not going to gain them what they think it's going to gain them. As a matter of fact, if they continue to rely on it, it's a detriment. It's a detriment to them because they're not leaning into the truth of this this man being sent by God. And that's what he says. They said, we're not illegitimate children. We have one father, God himself. Jesus answered, "If you, if, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and now I am here. Now, clearly, we know that Jesus is from God, but we are reading this through the lens of the resurrection. We are post-resurrection people. So any time that we talk about or read about Jesus or study Jesus in any way, we do that through the lens of the resurrection. That's the point. We do it through the lens of the resurrection. They don't have that lens, but they do have the lens of giving the blind man his sight, raising someone from the dead, healing children from afar off, turning water into wine. They have the lens of Jesus doing things that are definitely God things. Even if they don't want to accept him, they they have to acknowledge that he carries this God power. And he's not trying to use this power for evil. So there might be those who would argue that, you know, he is um, from the devil. But he's not doing anything to try. He's not gaining anything. He's not trying to build his own power, or his own lineage, or his own wealth. He's not using anything to, to, to manipulate or obfuscate anything. So, I mean, he's purely giving for the sake of others. And every time that that Jesus pulls out the divine punching bags or the divine, you know, dumbbells and starts flexing his muscles, he doesn't gain from it. We don't ever see Jesus, you know, like turning water into wine and getting a mansion for himself while he's at it. That's never part of the deal. Jesus doesn't do miracles in order to get something out of it. So what would be the point of, of manipulating any of that? If you're not going to get anything, well, then do the miracle and move on. And that's that's where Jesus is at on that end. So so he's doing these things. And they're like, you know, and Jesus is like, look, I'm doing the will of the Father. I'm doing the work of the Father, but you're not believing. I'm here. If, if, if God were your Father, you would love me. You would embrace me. You would understand what I'm doing. You would acknowledge what I'm doing. But you're not because God isn't your Father. Why do you not understand what, what I say? It's because you cannot accept my word. He says, you cannot accept that I come from God. You cannot accept that God is doing anything other than what you think God should be doing. And this is really the key. This is really the key here is that they can't accept that God would work any other way than how they want God to work. They expect God to do A, B, C. And if God's doing B, C, A or C, B, W, well, then it's not God. Even though it's truly, definitely God, it's not God. Because God isn't doing it the way we want to do it. And that's what Jesus is confronting here. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot accept my word. You are from your father, the devil, and you choose to do your father's desire. He's a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Um, so, so Jesus is like, look, you're truly doing the will of your father. You just got to make sure that you claim what right father it is. It's not Abraham and it's not God. Your father is the devil. You are doing the work of the devil. You are following in along the lines of the devil. That's what you're doing. You're doing the work of the devil. And so that is the one to whom you are a father. See, that's the thing is that if you're going to claim a spiritual father, whatever work you're doing, that's your spiritual father. And for them, they're doing the work of the devil. They're trying to kill him which is nowhere in any kind of Jewish teaching. You know, you, you suddenly go, oh, I don't agree with you, so we're going to kill you. No, it doesn't work that way. Especially when God is being revealed. And that's what Jesus is saying. Look, your father is not God, and it's not Abraham. You might be descendants of Abraham. You might be circumcised into the tradition of Abraham, but your father is the devil because you're doing the work of the devil. You're participating in the lies and the murder and the assault of the devil. You want to kill me. 
Why do you want to kill me? I mean, if if I'm that close to tearing down your power, then you got to question who I am. But if I'm not, then just let me be. But they're trying to kill me because you're doing the work of your father, which is the devil. That's what Jesus is saying. He is really confronting this behavior, this desire to kill him, not as a protection of God's community, not as a protection of the temple, but as a work of the devil. Because the devil doesn't want the truth to be told. The devil doesn't want the truth of the gospel to get out there. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And so when you speak for him, you speak in his nature. That's the point. That's what we try to convince is that, you know, when we talk in the eyes of God, when we talk about God, we're talking, God's talking through us. We're not necessarily just proclaiming our own self, but we have the power of the Holy Spirit working with us for the good. But if you're proclaiming the devil, then, then if, if you're lying, then you're proclaiming the devil. You're just bringing forth the devil's agenda into the world. Um... But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Well, no. And, and that's the thing is, is when you've convinced about something, when you're convinced that the sky is purple, no matter what truth is being told to you, the sky is purple. Well, that's what's going on here is they're convinced of a truth. And anything that is brought forward that challenges that truth is going to be wrong, period. And that's what they say. You're wrong because you challenge that truth, regardless of whether that truth whether that's right or not. So, so the truth is being challenged. The truth is being challenged, is being challenged by, um, you know, the, the, the truth is challenging the devil and the people don't like it because they're seeing their power being lost. So rather than engaging and embracing God and being humble and submissive, they turn and they want to kill Jesus because Jesus is challenging their truth with the truth of God. Which of you convicts me of sin? I tell you the truth. Why do you not believe me? Whoever is from God hears the word of God. The reason you do not hear them is that you are not from God. So, so again, and Jesus is not condemning them. Keep this in mind. Jesus is not casting them into the fires of hell. That is not his job. What he's doing is he's calling out this because he wants them to be better. These are leaders in the temple. He wants his temple back. So he's calling out the devil's behavior in leading in the temple. He's calling out the the Pharisees and the scribes' behavior of giving the devil power in the temple. He wants his temple back. And because he wants his temple back, he's calling out the lies of the devil. And he's calling out the leaders who are buying in to the lies of the devil. Now, this is certainly not going to make those in power happy. This is not a happy thing for those in power. As a matter of fact, those in power are going to be supremely unhappy because their unhappiness is going to get, I mean, come on, Jesus is calling them following the devil. Of course, they're going to be unhappy. They're going to be supremely unhappy, so unhappy, in fact, that they're really going to amp up their desire to kill him. They want to silence him. Jesus has gone as far as saying now that the leaders of the temple are bowing down to the devil. Now, does he, again, there's no condemnation here. He's not trying to kick them out. He's actually trying to convert them back to where they were before. He's actually trying to convert them back to this idea of serving God and being humble and submissive and not, not engendering this power that they're engendering because they are Pharisees and scribes. He's actually trying to call them back to something more faithful. Because he wants the temple to grow. He wants things to move forward. Jesus didn't come to dismantle the temple. He didn't come to dismantle the Jewish faith. He didn't come to dismantle the people. He came to redirect it. You know, and and, and not that the two are equated. Luther and Jesus are not equated in any way. But but when Luther posted the 95 Theses, it was the same thing. Many of the reformers... It's the same thing. They're not looking to break away or tear down. They're looking to, to redirect and change and better. Jesus didn't come to destroy the temple. He didn't come to destroy the faith. He came to enhance it, to fulfill it, to bring it to fruition so that all the world would bow down and understand who God is. But that wasn't the response. The response was something very different. The response was that of rejection. Rejection. 
and lies and assaults rather than acceptance and truth and love. And that's what we see. That's what Jesus is responding to here. He's responding to that res- that response that the leaders in the synagogue are giving him. Not one of, oh, okay, well, maybe you got this going on, but no, you're, you're the one from the devil. You know, Jesus is telling the people, the leaders of the synagogue, that they're, that they're following the devil. He wants his synagogue back, and he wants his leaders to be leaders. So he's identifying the truth of where they are. Because remember, you know the truth, the truth makes you free. Once you realize you're following the wrong path, then that's when change happens. That's when you redirect. But that doesn't happen until you acknowledge that you're following the wrong path. Until you acknowledge where you're at, then you can move forward. But you can't move forward until then. You can't move forward until you acknowledge where you're at and who you're following and how it's either right or wrong. And that's where Jesus is at right now. All right, we're going to leave it there, my friends. We're going to stop here. A lot going on. Like I said at the beginning, you know, uh, John is so much more about this, you know, internal struggle, this this um, divine human struggle, this this struggle of of um, of the will, the struggle of truth. You know, the the synoptics are far more about um, you know kind of bringing forward the chronology. But John is laying out some really powerful stuff here about this internal struggle, about this interaction. And it's so important for us to see that, you know, the Pharisees and the scribes, they think they're doing it right. They think they're going down the right road. They think they're following what um, what Abraham would have expected. But Jesus is calling them out, not because they're not from Abraham, they're descendants of Abraham, but because they're not doing what Abraham would have done. They're not following in the path of Abraham. They're following in the path of a murder and a liar, and that's the devil, because they're trying to kill Jesus. They're trying to kill him for what he says, which means that he's probably on the right track, and he's about ready to take down some, some massive amounts of power and some massive amounts of, of control, and that's a problem. Look, anybody who's in control doesn't want to give up control. <laughs> it's just the nature of control. Anybody who has power doesn't want to give up power. It's the nature of power. So... The Pharisees, the scribes, the Jews, they don't want to give up their power over the temple. So they're going to cling to their power and they're going to try to silence Jesus, even if their power isn't stemming from God or from Abraham, but from the devil. And that's what Jesus is identifying here. All right, my friends, um, as always, my contact information is going to come up at the end of the um, at the end of this session. So please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or what have you. I'd be happy to talk to them. Type to, if I can bring it up in the next session, I will, or I can reach out to you directly, whatever it is. Um, and if there's something that I'm not being clear about or you'd like me to address, please let me know that. And again, I'll do the best I can to cover that. Thanks for being part of this. Thanks for participating. Like I said at the beginning, if this is powerful, if, if, if you can, share this out there. Get it out there for others to follow. Um, and tag me in it if you can or tag the church in it so we see where you're at. So as always, God bless you. Have a great day, a wonderful week, and we'll talk to you next time.